In tonight's video, I'm going to be bringing you guys a special compilation of strange eyewitness encounter stories. Everything from missing persons, the Mothman, cryptid stories, lore, and legend. Stay tuned because this one is going to get freaky. Alex, one of the many recent eyewitnesses who has reached out to me, shared with me several eyewitness stories, and I will be sharing several of hers. In fact, her first one happened in early spring or summer of 2006, or maybe even the following year of 2007. There wasn't any snow left on the ground, and it was after her mother had passed on January 15th. She didn't journal it, as she thought that her sister might read it and think she was crazy or something, as she had always had boundary issues with her sister. It was dumb, but she was almost 18 and didn't think of the danger at all at the time. She began taking early morning walks without telling her father or sister. In the country, though, she did not fear coyotes or people like she should have, especially as a female, and took no protection, like a gun, knife, bear spray, etc. She wanted to stay healthy and always enjoyed being alone in nature. Well, one morning, it was a beautiful day, and she had heard the birds and everything, and it seemed normal, even though it was quite foggy. And she takes a walk down the road, and it was only a short way before heading home. Everything seemed fine until she got past a tiny pond between the house and the closest neighbors. And that's when she gets this strange feeling of being watched. And she stops to look back, and she saw this shape of what looked like a man walking behind her a ways. She didn't hear the birds anymore, and it could have just been because she was scared, and they stopped walking like they realized that Alex had seen them, which scared her even more, wondering if now she could make it back without this random creep walking down the road. The neighbor, who was in his 60s and wouldn't walk behind her like this, and pretty sure he was sleeping still anyway. It was still too far back for her to make out any details, just a shadowy human figure. It looked like they had a hood on, though, and it was hard to tell for sure, between the fog and distance and then after standing there, afraid of why she was seeing what looked like a man following her on the road, what seemed like a long time. Probably a couple of seconds or minutes, really. He turned and his body seemed to shimmer or morph, and he jumps into the ditch, changing shape before her very eyes, bounding into the field on all fours, looking like a wolf and nothing like a human anymore, and then disappeared into the woods and the fog. She turned, ran home, and didn't go for a morning walk again for a long time after this. She hadn't ever heard of dogmen or anything, so it made what she had saw more unbelievable. She knows this sounds like something that's made up or that something she had possibly imagined or like a Twilight Saga werewolf, but she had been awake long enough before her walk and wasn't drugged up or half asleep or drunk. Her father would have not stood for her to use any substance in her house anyway. And she thought of this once when a guy that she knew mysteriously tried hinting that he wasn't exactly human. She didn't mention this story to him but never understood what joke he was trying to make. Alex's father had always been a very outdoorsy person, and though she picked up the love from him, he never told her about any tales of encountering the supernatural. As with mental health, it was just something that this side of the family wouldn't ever talk about, which is sad. Not until closer before he passed, which he then told his kids that he had seen dark shapes and figures in his room that actually were not there. But perhaps that story is for another time. One of the more famous and terrifying creatures we're going to be talking about tonight is the infamous Mothman. This story begins as every good horror story does. On the evening of November 12, 1966, in the town of Clinton in West Virginia, a group of gravediggers was working when they claimed they saw something fly over them. It scared the crap out of them as they observed it go from tree to tree. They described it as a brown humanoid being. Now, this sounds absolutely absurd. However, the story gets even stranger and creepier because on November 15th, 1966, two couples were hanging out in a car one evening. As they were sitting there in their car, they were to receive the shock of their life when they all of a sudden noticed a strange creature standing in front of their vehicle. Roger Scarberry and Steve Mallett were so traumatized by this that they told the local newspaper, Point Pleasant Register, about their encounter. They described the creature as being a six to seven foot tall biped. They said it also had bright red eyes that were about 10 inches apart and that it also had wings. And its wingspan was probably close to 10 feet. 
They also noted that this creature was a fast flyer. They claimed if they had to guess that it could fly to close to 100 miles per hour. As mentioned earlier, they said it was bipedal, but they claimed it wasn't a good walker. The reason they know that is that the creature chased their car all the way to the outskirts of Point Pleasant. Now, once reaching the outskirts of Point Pleasant, though it switched from flying to walking or on two legs, they said it had the most awkward looking walk and that it walked into a field where it disappeared from their sights. Now, on the surface, this seems straight bonkers. However, when you really start to wade through it and look a little closer, it does start to get creepy. The first thing to note is that Clendenin is between 70 to 90 miles away from each other. Assuming that Scarberry and Mallet's description of this creature it being able to fly at 100 miles per hour was even remotely close, then the creature could have very well easily covered that distance within an hour's time. Even if they were way off and say the creature could really only fly 10 miles an hour, it still could have made the distance in three days alone. Another thing that makes this even more interesting is that it's not just one person that is saying they saw this creature. It is in fact multiple eyewitnesses all corroborating their own details with each other, which gives to more credibility. However, over the next couple of days, more people would come forth about their strange sightings and encounters with this beast that was being nicknamed the Mothman. Now, over the next three days, a total of eight more sightings had occurred. Sightings continued over the next year. And another interesting aspect of this case is that at some point, if stories are to be believed, it seems that the men in black became involved somehow. When the term men in black is used, it's almost entirely related to UFO reports. The legend goes that somebody will usually witness a UFO, and then within a few days or even an hour, some men will show up wearing black suits and looking very strange, like porcelain skin. They will try to accost you and intimidate you and scare you into silence. Residents of Point Pleasant reported that not long after the first sightings, strange men in black suits began to show up and began to intimidate and accost witnesses into silence. So, is there any truth to that? Who really knows? The men in black are an interesting phenomenon and many things about them doesn't exactly make sense. Some people believe they are actually government agents. However, Others claim that they are something else entirely. Some witnesses describe them from a distance that they look like ordinary people. However, upon closer inspection, they look off. Some witnesses say that if there are two of them, they look identical, but too similar. While we all know that there are shadow government agencies out there, there has been no official proof that the men in black are real, or should we say, no official proof. The best evidence to support the men in black comes from a video captured and the eyewitness account that happened a couple of years back. If the account is accurate, and if this were happening to the people at Point Pleasant, it would be pretty terrifying. However, we shouldn't be terrified as the skeptics think they know what the Mothman really is. In fact, Dr. Robert L. Smith, a wildlife professor at West Virginia University, claims the Mothman is nearly nothing more than a sandhill crane. He even claims it could be a deformed sandhill crane. In the area, there is an old World War II ammunition manufacturing depot called the TNT area. Now, an interesting fact about the TNT area is that by 1983, it was considered one of the most polluted and contaminated areas in the entire United States. If this bird spent any time around there, it's possible that it could have been exposed to toxic, potentially mutating chemicals and thus could have caused it some physical deformities. Other skeptics say this was the work of some prankster or that it had to do simply with sleep paralysis. Gotta love skeptics, as sleep paralysis seems to always be on the list for any explanation. The Mothman entered legendary status, though, in 1975 because... On December 15, 1967, tragedy struck, and the Silver Bridge in Point Pleasant collapsed into the Ohio River. Now, a total of 46 people perished, and in 1975, author John Keel put two and two together and wrote a book called The Mothman Prophecies. In the book, Keel hypothesizes that the Mothman was actually a harbinger or omen for the bridge to collapse. His story took hold, and it is his story that has become the foundation for the legend of the Mothman itself. Now, if you visit Point Pleasant today, you will find that the Mothman has now become a huge part of the community. 
They have a Mothman Museum, and their tagline is pretty funny. It says, one of 12 things to do in Point Pleasant. However, in this museum, they have replicas of what the Mothman is supposed to look like, and they tell the various stories about encounters with this creature in the community over the years. The Mothman is an interesting beast and has left many people wondering what exactly it is. The skeptics, like they always do, say they know the answer. And while I am no expert, but I don't buy what the skeptics are selling here. Ironically, despite its name, the Mothman actually looks nothing like a moth. Almost all descriptions of this creature talk about red eyes. However, I find some reports to be interesting. They say the Mothman doesn't have a head and its eyes are located in its chest cavity area. To me, it's starting to sound like some type of machinery, but that's just a mere opinion. However, there's even wilder claims out there when it comes to the Mothman. Some have claimed that the Mothman visited both Chernobyl prior to the meltdown and was seen in New York City prior to 9-11. This has caused many people to claim that the Mothman is an omen of disaster. Once again, I can't for sure say that, or if they're reading into the Mothman prophecies too hard, and that's exactly what they believe. Jeremiah, whom was visiting his girlfriend, who lives about an hour away from Bellevue, in a small town called Stillwater, just east of Seattle. It was around 3 in the morning on Saturday when they had both decided to step out on her porch and smoke a cigarette. They were standing in front of her house, just chit-chatting away, and of course there are more woods along the sidewalk along the street and across from an open field around her house. The houses around are spaced apart with large yards between them, and across from them was also an empty field with scattered trees throughout, making it feel a lot more full. They talked about how cold it was, and she had mentioned to Jeremiah that she had this weird feeling, and that's when they began hearing a strange noise. At first, Jeremiah didn't hear it, but after a few seconds, he then heard it, and had listened to the strange almost moaning, groaning sound coming from the tree line off behind the house in the distance. This time, though, he knows for sure that his girlfriend had heard it too because the way she had looked at him and the expression she wore on her face was simply terrifying. Jeremiah turned to look where she was looking at the wood line, and although he did not see anything, he heard yet another strange sound coming from the woods the second he looked, and it was unlike anything they had ever heard before and it really scared both of them. Now his girlfriend, she's lived out here for probably about six or so years now and has never heard anything like this. And so he's asking her what it could be and they both have no idea. So they're standing there for a few moments trying to figure out what was this noise and what animal could possibly be making it. Jeremiah insisted that they should both go inside because whatever it was seemed to be getting closer and closer. However, before going inside, Jeremiah just happened to have his little Zoom handheld recorder with him that he had brought, and he had recorded probably about 30 or so seconds of it, the same clip you guys just heard at the beginning of this episode. Whatever it was in the background was setting off the dogs, and they would bark every time this thing would make a roar or a grunt or a groan, and at random times would seem to come closer to the house and then farther away. And this went on till about 5 or 6 in the morning, according to Jeremiah and his girlfriend. And at times, because they were so terrified being locked in the house, they were looking outside and Jeremiah's girlfriend could have sworn that she had seen strange lights in the woods and had heard what sounded like people talking or making noise, but could not at all make out what they were saying. And so Jeremiah began asking her what it is that she had heard and who was out there but she couldn't exactly give a description because it was hard to tell. Jeremiah and his girlfriend felt completely on edge, like they could hear something huge coming towards the house in the trees near the back porch. What's a little unsettling is that for Jeremiah's girlfriend, her back porch is only roughly 30 or so feet away from the thick timber, as a reference point. A pretty unnerving experience in this case. Jeremiah assumed that this could just be a large black bear, but... His girlfriend quickly dismissed the notion that bears don't make this kind of sound, and neither are sure what this could be, if anything. 
And since this recording, they have both been actively trying to find out what the source of this noise was and what animal was making it. Jeremiah ends his letter with saying that he doesn't know what lives out in the woods that makes that kind of noise, but his girlfriend and him both agree that it reminded them of a giant reptile or something. At least that's how he said it sounded that night when he was out there capturing the sounds. All of the backyard woods, if you go far enough back, you actually go into the bog reserve. So it's just thick timber and woods for miles on right against the national forest. So who knows what's living in it? Even just telling this story brings back those memories and terrifies both Jeremiah and his girlfriend. Which really makes me wonder personally, what did he capture on that recording that night? Was it something strange and mysterious, perhaps supernatural, or was this simply just a black bear or maybe a fox and maybe just a misidentification? I'll let you guys be the judge. Baxter's story is very similar and like the first, very interesting. Baxter and two friends had planned a deer hunting trip on the weekend of October 24th of 1997. They had reserved a forest service cabin on the north end of Young's Lake. They packed up the boat, and on the morning of Friday the 24th, they departed in Juneau a little late, but right around 1 or 2 in the afternoon, after anchoring the boat in the cove in Young's Bay at around 4 p.m. After getting all their stuff to the shore, one of the guys needed to sight his rifle. So by the time they got to the trailhead, it was now getting close to dark. The trail to the cabin and the lake is roughly five miles apart. So they decided to walk in the dark so they could get a good start in the morning from the cabin. They're not sure of the evening hours it took to hike this trail and didn't really pay much attention to the time. Baxter at the time had a mini mag light and so did one of his friends. The other had a bigger nine volt battery light, but it had a very pathetic beam. Within half an hour of starting, it was already dark. They had cloud coverage and no moonlight that they could notice. The trail was easy going, but very winding with occasional routes to step over. At what Baxter can guess would be around mile three, they noticed that they had a large animal walking the trail ahead of them. They naturally assumed it was a brown bear because, hey, Alaska. And they stopped for several minutes and discussed what they should do about it. They told the guy with the bigger light to keep pointing down the trail so they wouldn't be tripping over roots and decided to keep walking. They just kept trying to flashlight whatever was ahead of them. Once they began walking again, they could hear it start walking too. The footsteps were heavy and the distance was just too far ahead to get the flashlights on it. When they would stop and whisper about this animal, it would stop, then start again after they would start walking. It was really getting a little creepy. And then... At around mile four, this bear, they presume, walks off the trail to its left and into the woods. The sound was definitely that of a very heavy animal. From what they could tell is that it went about 100 feet or so into the woods and stopped. Their hesitancy to continue was really bugging them, but they began to walk again. They never heard anything else from that point on and made it to the cabin, ate, talked, and joked about it, set their alarms, and went to bed. Now, on Saturday morning... Baxter got up and went outside to relieve himself and was immediately dumbfounded. There were moose droppings out in front of the cabin. There are no moose on Admiralty Island. Baxter had thought to himself, this trip is beginning to feel very surreal. The other two guys decided they would hunt together and head for a ridgeline behind the cabin in a northern direction. Baxter planned to go alone, always hunts alone anyway, across the lake to a ridgeline south of the cabin. When they split up, it was now around 7.30 a.m. Baxter took one of the cabin boats across the lake and up to a small ridge right from the bank of the river. Right when this little ridge was ending into a flat area, something to the left of Baxter made noise, and when he looked there, there was a moose about 100 yards away. Of course, common sense said, do not shoot it or you may become the most hated man in southeast Alaska. He learned later that Fish and Game had captured a moose on Douglas Island in Juneau and transplanted it on Admiralty at Admiralty Cove the year before. Why put it on Admiralty? Didn't make sense. It must be the loneliest moose on the planet. Baxter then crossed the flats heading towards the ridgeline where he wanted to hunt. To get up to the ridgeline, Baxter would have to climb the slope of this mountain to an elevation of around 3,000 feet and continue on the ridge walking uphill. Almost near the top, while still climbing, he got up on what appeared to be a switchback trail made of dirt. He was at its lowest elevation, and to his left, it went about 25 feet, 
Then to the right, another 25 feet to a root and a big five to six cedar tree on the left. When he got to the root and was stepping up over it, he noticed this smoothed out beige granular sand in front of the tree. After he was standing on the sand to his left, blackness then caught his eye and in reflex, he turned with his rifle ready for a hip shot. With his peripheral vision, he thought black bear, but it was a dark hole. Under the base of the tree, a big hole had been dug out. It was probably about three and a half feet wide and about two and a half to three feet tall and about three feet deep. It was freshly dug. This hole was between two roots with an area of about five feet wide at the tree and fanned out from there between two big roots. Baxter noticed how smooth the sand was and his footprints were being made in it. He moved to the second root and on the other side of where large footprints, big footprints, the sole of his boot is 12 inches. He stepped on one of the prints heel to heel and it was 16 inches long and about six to six and a half inches wide. Within seconds of stepping into this print, Baxter looks up and could see over this draw filled with Adler trees. About 100 feet away from Baxter, the top of an Adler tree began to shake and violently move back and forth. Baxter would say that this tree was around 35 to 45 feet tall with a trunk of maybe 8 inches in diameter. It was the back and forth shaking that really caught his attention. And so Baxter exclaimed to himself, man, that takes hands, because at that point he was completely freaked out and he was starting to move now downhill away from it. And he could hear all this crashing as whatever it was went uphill and away from him. All the crashing ended in about a minute or less, and he never saw what it was because the brush and trees were simply too thick. He never stopped moving and going back the way he came. He made it back to the cabin right around 1 p.m., and his hunting partners were already at the cabin. They told him that there were no deer up where they went and didn't think there would be any deer in this area anyway. So Baxter tells them that something freaked him out where he had gone and generally what had happened. Baxter and friends decide to cut the trip short and pack up the gear. They left that afternoon and stayed at the Admiralty Cove Trailhead cabin because it was getting dark. They got back home on Sunday afternoon on the 26th. Baxter has shared his story with some people from time to time, but mainly keeps it to himself. Whatever they thought about it or Baxter didn't seem to show much from them, so who knows. Baxter did not go deer hunting again until October of 2000 with four other people in Seymour Canal on Admiralty Island. Baxter got two deer on that trip, but felt so uncomfortable in the woods alone. He has not hunted since then and don't think he ever will. He's always on edge in the woods when he's alone and even with a friend or two during a hike. So as to what it was he encountered, it's hard to truly say what it was. The footprints were definitely real and most likely in a place nobody would have ever been to. His opinion is that he had encountered a Sasquatch on the mountainside. What was on the trail is up in the air to him. It could have been a bear, but the problem with the bear opinion is how heavy the footsteps were. A bear's gliding walk generally does not make much noise. So I'll leave it up to you guys. What do you guys think of Baxter's story? Prior to the Chernobyl meltdown, several workers witnessed a seven foot tall humanoid winged figure. It too was headless, but had red eyes. The locals referred to it as the Blackbird. The workers who supposedly witnessed this creature became plagued by nightmares and even received threatening phone calls. This story is incredible. However, the hard part is trying to verify if it's true. An archaeologist named Robert Maxwell has done work at the Exclusion Zone, and he said that the locals in the area told him of the story, so we know the story is true. The question is, though, did this really happen, or is this a myth that we created after the disaster? Unfortunately, all the workers who apparently saw this creature are all dead, making it hard to verify the story. As for the story about the Mothman being spotted in New York City before September 11, well, I could not find much. Unlike actually news reports, the theory really is ambiguous and leaves that up in the air as to whether the sighting really happened. El Chupacabras, translated into English, basically just means goat sucker. This creature of nightmares was first reported in 1995 in Puerto Rico. It was claimed that a strange animal had been attacking goats and sheep and other livestock instead of eating the goats and the sheep for a meal. The only thing this creature seemed to be after was the blood. In fact, witnesses claimed that this creature would puncture the animals and then drain the carcass of all its blood. What is interesting is how the chupacabra is described. In Puerto Rico, 
it was described as this reptilian kangaroo demonic creature that stood upright and had red eyes, while others describe it as being the size of a small dog or bear with spikes running out of its back. Its skin is supposedly greenish or gray and leathery looking, and it hops around like a kangaroo. Others describe it like a different kind of animal. They say this chupacabra looks almost canine-like, the only difference being it is hairless and the head looks different. Skeptics point out that a movie called Species came out in 1995, and the monster in that movie was the inspiration for the tales of the chupacabra. I'm not exactly sure if that's the case. However, I'm shocked they didn't blame it on sleep paralysis and call it a day. Other explanations for the chupacabra are that people are seeing a hairless Mexican dog or a coyote with mange or a canine hybrid. They claim that the debilitating condition of mange would make an animal act differently and would explain why these animals are attacking domesticated animals compared to wild animals. While there's never been any proof of a reptilian kangaroo looking animal hopping around, there is some video evidence that shows a strange canine looking animal running around. Whatever the case is, I find it highly unlikely that whatever people were seeing in Puerto Rico was a dog with mange. I also don't know if that the movie was the basis of the Chupacabra either, whether they're real or not. I just hope that I never have the pleasure of stepping out my front door and seeing a strange reptilian creature moving around. I recently received an email from a man who calls himself Craig, and he has a true story that occurred in Washington State on 1993 in Christmas Eve on Fire Trail Road. Now, there are three parts to this story, but he just wanted to stick to the actual events in the interest of time. It was a snowy Christmas Eve this year, and their house was full of Christmas spirit. His sisters and his mom and his dad were getting ready to visit and have dinner with some local friends in Marysville, Washington. At the time, they had lived in Everett, Washington. And Craig was watching a rather strange Christmas cartoon where a UFO had come down to interact with humans on Christmas Day. And Craig can still remember the song from the show. In retrospect, he believes that these visitors were preparing him for what was to come. Now, on their way back from Smoky Point and a prosperous dinner, the snow was really coming down hard, and Craig and his family decided to take a back road on native land called Fire Trail Road. There were lots of trees and very few lights and no other traffic as it was Christmas Eve and right around 10 p.m. As they're driving from the back seat, Craig had yelled with surprise to his dad at the sight of a giant white owl with brilliant yellow eyes in a tree. His dad noticed the owl and instantly pulled over to get a better look because it was so strange. Craig's dad and him exited the vehicle and gazed in awe when it spread its enormous wings and flew away. And that's when Craig and his father saw it. A gigantic, several football fields length wide, multicolored disc descended directly above their vehicle at less than 100 feet. It was glorious and spinning slowly and completely silent. In fact, Craig claims it had some sort of sound dampening capabilities because he could not hear him and his father speak or their mother who was yelling. They could not listen to her. Craig's mother was in total panic at the sight of this above their car and was screaming at Craig and his father to get back in the car now. She was a mess. And Craig can remember the cartoon not taking his eyes from the craft because of how quickly it would move when it left. And after what seemed like a few moments, it departed. And Craig was correct. He has never seen anything move so fast in his entire life. It shot up so freakishly quickly it was almost like a cartoon. The speed at which it moved and punched a large hole in the clouds as it left utterly silent. When it departed, Craig could suddenly hear his mother screaming and all other sounds around him returned. It was the most fantastic experience besides his own child's birth. Now in 2020, Craig would lose his father to cancer. It was a peaceful death and before he had passed, he discussed that incident that happened so many years ago because nobody in Craig's family has ever forgotten it. There was missing time, and they drove home safe, and that night, there was yet another visit. The entities that visited them were these tall, Nordic-looking white beings. They were benevolent and compelling. Angelic was the word that comes to mind. He remembers being very upset afterward that they didn't take him with them. Later on, Craig had a visit from one of these male entities, which stood at roughly 10 feet, 
and he had a kind look on his face and reassured Craig with a smile without saying anything that he would see them again. And Craig swears with every word that is written, it is 100% true, and he wouldn't change that experience for the world, as it made him look at the world in a different light and never have to question if there are other entities around them. With Washington State being a paranormal hotspot in the country, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Craig's story is in fact true. Sebastian's story happened to him nearly 20 years ago when he used to live in Puerto Rico. He was 17 at the time and lived with his parents. For a little bit of background information, his parents owned a house in a small town in what be considered a suburban area. The house didn't have a garage and the only vehicle they had was Sebastian's dad's and he would always park his car in the side of the house which had a clear view of the backyard where there were trees and behind that was an empty field. So dad would always come home around 6 or 7 p.m. and always park his vehicle there. This detail is important for later. Now around the time, there weren't smartphones or anything like that so their way of socializing before the media became the new thing, his neighbors and friends used to hang out at his place a lot. In fact, most times, they would sit at night in front of the house, which would face the street and just talk about school and whatever video games they were into at the time. This usually would be for a while longer on weekends since they didn't have to worry about school the following morning. Now, on this particular night, for some reason, Sebastian couldn't exactly remember why his father wasn't home yet, but there was an empty space there where his car would usually be, where he parked, which allowed him and his friends to see the backyard of the house while they were talking from the front side of the house. Now, his friend, whom he referred to as K for the story, was there with him, talking as per usual, waiting for the rest of the friends to arrive that night. It was probably right around 7 p.m., and it wasn't too dark yet when they were both in the middle of their conversation. Sebastian stops and interrupts his friend. He freezes immediately as he was looking towards the backyard up in one of the trees. Now, at first, he thought he saw someone on one of the tree branches, but the thing was so animalistic looking, and the more Sebastian stared at it, the more disturbed he was now becoming because he realized this could not be a person. The eyes of this thing were red and like nothing he had ever seen before. It had a distinct glow to it, and as crazy as it sounds, the best description he could give was a monkey-faced creature, but with wings. This thing was at least five feet crouching in the tree branches, so there's no telling how truly tall it was. Sebastian at the time was so shocked that he was seeing this, but whatever this thing was, it wasn't moving or doing anything other than staring back in their direction. So Sebastian quietly, but without taking his eyes off of his friend, asked him, Kay, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And please, if you do, tell me, what does it look like? And Sebastian had to ask without telling him what he was seeing out of fear that he was the only person seeing it, which I guess in hindsight would have been a good thing because that means it wouldn't have been real. But to Sebastian's horror, his friend responded, I see a freaking monkey face with red eyes and wings. And that's the moment Sebastian felt a chill run through his body because he realized how real this thing was now. And out of fear, him and his friend rush inside the house, close the door behind them, and his mom was there sitting in the living room, giving them a strange look. Now, one quick thing you need to know about Sebastian's family is they were not strangers to the paranormal and weird sightings, but that is, of course, another story for another day. And this was definitely something different than anything the family had ever experienced at the time. As Sebastian told his mom what they had seen, she looked at him and looked at Kay's face, and that was all she needed to see and believe them. None of them ever dared to investigate for how scared they were and Sebastian and his friend or family never saw this thing again after that night. To this day, he has no idea what this thing was, what it wanted, or why it was there, since they didn't own any pets. He doesn't think this was the infamous Chupacabra, since the physical features of this thing didn't look too typical to the description, but he's sure glad he is no longer there to potentially see this thing again. We've all heard of Slenderman, but probably none of us have ever heard of Black Stickman. Stick men or men are described as 2D abnormally tall slender beings. They are dead quiet and they cast no shadow. Many claim they are charged with electricity. Many witnesses claim that once an encounter starts, they will feel this surge of aggression or agitation. This can cause many people to believe these creatures give off a negative energy of sorts. They seem to be a relatively new phenomenon. And while many sightings have been dismissed as a hoax, 
there is some evidence out there that is up in the air. Mark Wolfgang Miller went out looking for these creatures and claims to have caught one on camera. However, he claims it is not as a good picture, but it's there. You can be the judge. The Darku. Scottish have the Loch Ness Monster and the Irish, well, they have the Darku. It is in the opinion of most people that this monster is now extinct. However, some people believe that a few might remain on Ackle Island. This creature is the stuff of nightmares. It is described as being a great otter. Others describe it as being a half-fish, half-dog hybrid, and other strange names which translate to Irish crocodile. This thing is apparently quite aggressive and does not favor humans or dogs. In fact, one story goes that in the 17th century, a woman named Grace McGloiglin was washing her clothes in the nearby body of water called Glenade Low. Her husband was alerted by her screams and came rushing over to see what was wrong. When he got there, it was too late. The Darku had already mutilated her body. Her husband instantaneously attacked the beast and killed it by stabbing it right in the heart. However, before it died, it let out this scream and then out of the water came another one. Now this other one attacked the man and took him down. This brings us to another creepy aspect about this creature and that is that they usually attack in pairs. Legends say that one would begin the attack and if it failed, it would return with its friends. It also didn't matter if you were in the water or on land. It would pursue you until it got tired or determined that the person was not worth the effort. Another interesting thing about this creature is that, unlike the other creatures here on this list, there is actually some archaeological evidence that shows perhaps this creature did indeed exist. There is a gravestone known as Kinluff Stone. It is told that the woman is buried there and she was a victim of the Darku in the 17th century. Another related gravestone is called the Glenade Stone. This stone actually has a dark who carved onto it. Thankfully, most people believe that if this creature ever did exist, it is actually now extinct. However, there are some people believe that they are still around, and they point to a 2003 sighting by Sean Corcoran. Hopefully, though, that is the last time it will ever be spotted. This creature has a very unusual name, Snallygaster. This creature can reportedly be found in Frederick County, Maryland. This creature gets its unique name from the German immigrants who settled in the area in the 1730s. They tell stories of being terrorized by a half-bird, half-reptile with a metallic beak lined with sharp teeth. Sometimes it apparently even had octopus-like tentacles. This terrifying creature was said to be able to swoop down quietly from the sky, grab a victim, and carry it off. It liked to suck the blood out of its victims. Apparently, though, if you have a painted seven-pointed star on your property, it would have been enough to keep this horror away from your house. In fact, you can still see the stars painted on some really old barns. The locals at the time called this beast Schnellergeist, which translates into faster spirit. Over time, though, the stories of this creature faded into obscurity and history. However, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, something strange was being reported yet again. Now, our good buddy the skeptics claim that these stories were brought back in order to scare the newly freed African-American slaves. Things really hit ahead in February and March of 1909, because newspapers began to report about locals who had encountered a beast that was described as having an eye in the center of its forehead, a long beak, a gigantic wingspan, and claws of steel. Things got so wild that the Smithsonian's even offered a reward for its corpse. President Theodore Roosevelt considered backing out of a safari trip to head to Maryland to look for this monster himself. At the end of the day, though, no corpse was ever recovered, and the only thing we have to go on is local accounts. On December 22, 2014, a James Thomas Griffin had disappeared. And unfortunately, on January 25, 2015, a body had been found along Boulder Creek Hiking Trail in the Olympic National Park in Washington State. James's story is very similar to many other hikers and campers who just mysteriously go missing in the national parks. James, for example, was just planning to innocently go hiking in the Olympic National Park in Washington State just before Christmas in 2014. He was last seen by other hikers at the Olympic Hot Springs right around 4 p.m. on that same day on the 22nd. 
but it wouldn't be until December 24th on Christmas Eve that he would actually be reported as missing when he failed to show up to a Christmas Eve dinner that he had planned with some friends a while back. Fast forward to the 25th or Christmas Day, there was no sign of James, but his backpack had shown up randomly. And on Sunday, January 25th, a whole 30 days later, James's body was finally recovered nearly 1,000 vertical feet above the trail. This, of course, begs for questioning. How did this happen? How did his body get up here? And what happened? James already was single. He was 60 years old. He was retired and he lived alone. So he was kind of more of a lone wolf. According to friends and family, he was an avid hiker and lover of the outdoors, but he wasn't a young gun like a 20-year-old hiker would be. But because of his frequent visitations at the park, he knew the park and the trails very well. What's interesting, when James's day pack was found on Christmas Day, it was roughly about a half mile away from the trailhead of the Boulder Creek Hiking Trail in the Olympic Peninsula's Elwa Valley and about 50 or so feet off the trail itself. The pack was leaning against a log, looking like items had somehow been removed and contained his equipment, like his stove, his water, his food. There was a camera in there, things to start fires and other provisions. It looked like somebody had been pulling stuff out, assuming it was James, because there was an actual towel laying on a nearby log and a Coke can set on top and a plastic coffee mug as well. And there was even an unfinished bag of prepared freeze-dried food that had been resealed. But yet, there was no signs of a struggle in the area at all, and the camera only contained an image of a nearby waterfall. So he had been walking around, probably taking nature photography, and just enjoying himself. So how does that explain his mysterious disappearance? Well, despite a week-long search with no clues popping up until a month later, when on January 25th, 2015, James's body was finally recovered about a third of a mile away and nearly 1,000 vertical feet above the trail. What's strange is according to park officials, it appeared that Griffin had stepped off the trail to prepare a snack, but at some point became disorientated and could not find the trail again. A spokesperson by the name of Barb Maines spoke out and said this, there's nothing to suggest anything other than someone who lost his location and could not find his backpack again, where he stepped off the trail and became lost and disorientated. As to why he climbed the steep hill where his body was found, Maines suggested, if it's dark and you can't see anything, it's easier to walk uphill. You are more in control. Now, of course, this is just speculation, but could this just be the county trying to write off any possible correlation between this and abductions or any of the many, many popular missing 411 cases that have strange, strange results surrounding the missing body found? An autopsy report was performed by county pathologist Eric Kiesel, and he indicated that James had died from hypothermia, much the same way many missing 411 victims do when they are found miles away from their body or a short distance away but up a high vertical cliff wall or something similar to how Robert died. Now, personally, if he had a leg injury as bad as he did, it doesn't make sense that he would randomly try to climb a thousand foot steep hill unless he was either scared or something had chased him up. But either way, personally, I find it very odd. And apparently, I'm not the only one that thinks so, because his brother even said when interviewed that the autopsy result was really odd. And he quoted that, it's just one of those things that happened and nobody will ever know what the reasons were for him going up the hill. So apparently, I'm not alone in my presumption that something strange had happened and this wasn't just a normal case of him wandering up a thousand foot hill with a leg injury and then just managed to die. That doesn't make sense, especially if he's already an intelligent, experienced, and avid hiker, which leads us to the question, what happened to James Griffin? Why did he leave his food pack just off the trail and climb a thousand feet up a steep hillside? You have to remember that he wasn't just climbing a thousand feet hillside, it was also pitch black. And for him, it would have been incredibly difficult. So we can only presume that something had spooked him or scared him or taken him. But what? What resides in the Olympic National Park that has those kinds of powers? Of course, the common theory with many investigators is that on his way back to his car, he had somehow got disorientated and got lost in the dark. But personally, I'm not buying it. Between all the National Park missing persons cases, there's just too many strange things going on. And I'm sure any of you out there watching this who know anything about the strange missing persons cases would probably agree when you look at the critical details of this case. 
The autopsy later confirmed that there were no substances, drugs, or alcohol involved. And ultimately, James is just written off as another mysterious death in the Olympic National Park. What do you think? The Fresno Nightcrawler is yet another infamous California cryptid. Although this creature hasn't been seen by nearly as many people, it does have some compelling proof as it was captured on security footage and is being dubbed the Fresno Nightcrawler because there is some confusion about when this creature was first spotted. Some places report that these strange, creepy-looking creatures were first reported in the 1990s. However, it is agreed upon that the first video evidence emerged in 2007. The story goes that in 2007, a local person living in Fresno who wishes to remain anonymous was terrified after reviewing their security footage. Mystified and terrified, they took their footage to Univision. Univision apparently didn't have any good explanation of what was going on in the video, so this person then submitted the video to a variety of paranormal investigators. One thing led to another, and the video eventually ended up on the show. Fact or faked? After running multiple experiments, they concluded that to fake this video would be very hard, and concluded that it was more likely than not genuine. This now opens up a whole bunch of questions. What are these things that look like walking pants? The truth is, is that nobody knows, and there aren't too many recorded encounters. However, it is important to note that Native Americans that originated in the area have lore that talk about these creatures. According to them, these creatures were on Earth long before humans. The reason they look the way they do is that they usually come from the swamp world. They claim that they are now part of a world, and they are peaceful creatures whose purpose is to bring us back into harmony with our natural surroundings. Keeping up with the theme of legendary Native American cryptids, this next animal is referred to as the Deer Woman. What is interesting about the Deer Woman is that there are two different species concerning them. The Native Americans that resided in the central plains and woodlands of North America view the Deer Woman as benign. It was said that these creatures would appear to people as a sign of fertility. The appearance is described as either being a deer with human features or being a direct human-deer hybrid. The Central Plain Indians, though, did say that sometimes these deer women would seduce men that were adulterers and lead them to their death or curse them with a life of pursuing love but never finding it. However, if you ask the Oklahoma natives about the deer woman, they have nothing good to say. They say a typical encounter with a deer lady it goes something like this. An innocent man will be walking along the trail, minding his own business, and suddenly he will see what looks like a girl standing off to the side of the trail. She will then call to the man, and if the man comes over and responds to her, summons, he will notice that she looks like a beautiful young woman. However, he soon sees that she has deer hooves for feet and brown eyes that look like deer eyes. Unfortunately for the man, he notices too late, and then she then decides to take care of him. Others claim that when you come across a deer lady, that it is a severe warning or could be a sign of personal transformation. One interesting thing is that the deer lady likes to dance and will often crash ceremonial dance nights. Often, she goes unnoticed and will dance till the drums stop. However, if she does get noticed, she usually will bolt. Some tribes don't take kindly to the crashing of their dancing ceremonies, so they have come up with ways to banish her. They say they can ward these creatures off with the use of tobacco and an ancient spell. Others claim that if you ever find yourself caught in the deer woman's trap, make sure you look at her feet and it will break her spell, and she will run off before she finishes you off. I'm not too sure myself, but there are countless Native American stories and claims that she does exist. Not only do they believe they are real, but there is also a general terror when it comes to these creatures. I mean, who can blame them? The last thing I want to think about when I encounter a beautiful woman in the forest is whether or not she's going to stomp my skull in. Casey's story deals with Wendigos. Casey's brother and him were out camping at a lake. A lake that you're technically not allowed to camp at. Now, this lake is in a small town called West Point in the Blue Mountains of California. As the crow flies, it's only about 60 to 70 miles away from Yosemite National Park. Now, at about 2 or 3 in the morning, Casey woke up and his first thought was, it's a wendigo. I have to stay still. At that point, he had never heard of it before, so he didn't know what it was or why he was thinking this thought. But he knew they were safe because they were sleeping in the cab of an S10 pickup 
that had a back seat, so they were able to lay the front seats down. Now, the next morning, when Casey and brother woke up, he brought it up to the brother about how he had woke up the night before, and he was just as confused as Casey was. They both brushed it off at the time, not thinking much of it. And a few months later, they went camping again close to the same area. This time, though, his brother in the cab of the truck, and he simply draped a tarp over the bed and slept in there, in the back. At about the same time in the morning, around 2 or 3, before he woke up this time, it wasn't simply thoughts popping up in his head waking him up. This time, it was because something was bouncing the truck, like somebody was pushing up and down on the tailgate of the truck, or like somebody was trying to bounce in the bed. At first, he thought it was his brother trying to mess with him, but then realized that he never heard the truck door open or close. The next morning, they both almost at the same time told each other, nice try, thinking that the other was trying to scare each other. That's when they decided to look up what a Wendigo was and that it felt very similar to the other stories of encounters, except they didn't smell anything, they didn't hear any voices. In fact, they didn't hear anything at all the entire time. And so now Casey and brother is wondering if it had something to do with two serial killers possibly around that area. Is it possible that something evil was lurking in the shadows that night and Casey's gut instinct had roused him from a sleep to protect him or was he simply overly paranoid and somebody was really just trying to mess with him shaking the bed of the truck? If it was something from the dark, why didn't it do more? January 20th of 1992, a Stefan Bizzard had disappeared near the Soul Duck Hot Springs in Olympic National Park in Washington State. Stefan, who was an exchange student from Germany, was actually studying down in Oregon State University and a very intelligent kid. He and another German student were hiking on January 20th, 1992 in the Solduck area, which is on the west side of the Olympic National Park. They had planned to hike to Deer Lake, which was only roughly four miles southwest of the current location. Stefan and his hiking friend separated for some reason and Bicert tried to hike out 23 miles to the Ho River Trailhead. When he had failed to arrive, of course, his friend had reported him missing on January 21st. He was not dressed or equipped to camp overnight in the snow, wearing only jeans and a shirt and a simple windbreaker. He only carried a day pack with him, which only contained a few provisions like a few pieces of fruit or some other small bits of miscellaneous food, but he had no hat, gloves, or equipment for overnight camping. That route would have taken Stefan into the heart of the Olympic high country and into a winter storm area that had hit that area all week long. Once a full-on search pursued, it included park rangers, mountaineer rescue teams with dogs and helicopters, even volunteer searchers, including members of the Kitsap-based Olympic Mountain Rescue were then deployed in search for Stefan. And after five days of very intensive searching, they failed to turn up any clues of the missing hiker and the search was ultimately called off. Search and rescue teams had contended with rain, sleet, cold, snow, and other extreme dangers of avalanches. And unfortunately, it is very likely that Stefan succumbed to the cold, bitter winter of Washington and was never found. Around the same time that the Snallygaster was terrorizing Maryland, another monster was terrorizing the residents of Arizona. In 1903, I.W. Stevens encountered a humanoid creature in the Grand Canyon. Stevens described the beast as having gray hair and a beard that reached its knees and talons. Four decades later, Don Davis encountered the same creature in the same area. However, these are not only people who have experienced this Sasquatch-like creature. Over the years, an image has begun to emerge, and that image is something like this. The Mogoyun monster is reportedly around 7 feet tall. It has insane strength and is covered in black or reddish-brown fur. It is incredibly violent and has an awful body odor. The smell is often compared to that of a skunk or dead fish, or decaying peat moss. It apparently walks with wide, inhuman strides and leaves behind 22-inch footprints. That is huge. Its favorite method of hunting is apparently to decapitate its victims. Thankfully, this beast has only been spotted in Arizona. Once again, the skeptics claim you have nothing to worry about as this beast is nothing more than a misidentified grizzly bear, but however, it also doesn't help that in 2006, a member of the Apache Nation came forward and said this, We're not prone to easily talk to outsiders, but there have been more sightings than ever before. It cannot be ignored any longer. 
It also doesn't help that Lieutenant Ray Burnett from the tribal police has reported seeing a creature on a couple of occasions that matched the descriptions of the Mogollon. He also says that over the years, he has received calls from citizens saying a strange creature was looking through their window. He said that he believes these reports as they come from trusted members of the community who were not drunk and were genuinely terrified of what they saw. Now, with that in mind, I'm not so sure that a Mogollon monster is a misidentified bear, as I am sure the Apache know what a grizzly bear is, or at least a bear, and can easily differentiate a bear from a creature, at least like the one they're describing. Then again though, I'm not a zoologist. What's interesting about the Mogollon monster is that the name Mogollon is actually Spanish and it's theorized that it predates the natives being in the area. But if the Mogollon does have Spanish origins, then what does that mean? Does that change its existence? Does that mean it's been around in the area longer than Bigfoot or any of the other creatures that supposedly exist? Really though, no matter which way you spin it, the Mogollon monster is something I do not want to meet. The Mam Lambo, a supposed mutant creature that's really the stuff of nightmares. Imagine a creature that is a combination of a snake, a crocodile, and a horse that has four legs. Now that you've pictured that, also add to that mixture that it is a bioilluminescent creature and appears green at night. Also, picture two gleaming green eyes that have the power to mesmerize and captivate its victims. If you ever visit South Africa, that is the story you will hear from the local Zulu and indigenous populations that live along that river. It is claimed that this monster has a taste for brains, and not like a zombie. It likes to catch its victims and drown them, and once they're drowned, it likes to crack open the soft skull and eat the contents within. While many of the locals are convinced that this creature is real, police aren't having any of it. In fact, the police say that the victims that people claim are the victims of this Mambalo are just actually drowned victims. Police also say that any parts of the face that have been eaten away are merely the work of river crabs. So, case closed. The locals don't think so, though. They claim that reports of this monster go back thousands of years and they are not being superstitious. So who's right? And who really knows? When it comes to marine animals, it can be very hard to identify. But after all, South Africa is known for its mystique and strange cryptids all running throughout it, if you look into its history. It is possible there could be something lurking around that river. So more importantly, what do you believe? This third story was submitted by an anonymous person. This story was told to them by their former son-in-law in, in mid-December 2013. Their wife, 14-year-old stepdaughter, and them were up visiting their daughter in South Central Oklahoma from Central Texas giving her Christmas presents and stuff for her first child, a daughter. His daughter and son-in-law lived with his grandparents out in the middle of nowhere, about three miles off a state road on property where the house sat about a fourth mile off the secondary road. And they lived about 50 miles north of Thackerville, where what they would later find out is where Brown Springs Road is located and the area is well known for sightings. As they're hanging out with their daughter, her husband had come home from work and joined in the conversations and was visiting along. Now about 10 minutes goes by and he hears his daughter say to him, tell dad about it. She wasn't done with her sentence, but that caught the dad's attention and he was bracing for something crazy like the son or husband was going to tell him they were into BDSM or threesomes or something else crazy, right? Well, as that thought went through the dad's mind, his daughter finished her sentence with, he'll believe you. This, of course, perked the dad's interest as responded with, believe what? His daughter's husband began to tell him how his daughter and a friend of theirs was coming home from a movie three weeks before. It was about 9.30 p.m. with overcast sky making the area pitch black with the only light sources on the secondary being about two or three houses that were scattered down the secondary road. They turned left or east into the driveway, which was pretty dirt ruts from tires with grass in the middle and the lights from his grandparents' house about a quarter mile drive. And he claims that they were about halfway down the drive when there was a cluster of trees that sat maybe two or so feet off the passenger's side facing south. Now, this is when something huge stepped out from the tree line and planted its foot on the driver's side of the car, right in the driveway. It had black hair with patches of gray, very massive, and so close to the car, the headlights only illuminated up to its shoulder, as it did not see its head. He guessed it was at least eight feet tall, and the incident took maybe three seconds as it ran past the car, heading northbound across a field moving faster than anything living they had ever seen in the darkness. The dad looks at his daughter, 
and she was terrified as her husband was telling their story and he seemed uneasy talking about it. The dad was stunned and asked his daughter if they told the grandparents about this and they said yes, but the granddad said he didn't believe them while he seemed irritated by the story. So the dad walked into the living room and began to ask the granddad about it and the granddad was like, yeah, all three of them came in here and telling what they saw and I told them they were just saying things. So then the dad told him, well, if they were just saying things, who could all of them see the same thing? And at that moment, the granddad looked at him almost angry and muttered something about he thought he had more common sense than that. The granddad's wife was sitting right there the whole time, not saying a word, which the dad thought was weird because the woman always had something to say about everything. She of all people probably knew. She was full-blooded Chickasaw, which made him remember a show he had seen on the Travel Channel called Bigfootville, where they apparently talked to some Native Americans, and one of the people that was interviewed on the show said that some of the tribes will not speak of Bigfoot for fear of them showing up. And one of these segments on the show was about 45 miles from where they lived in Oklahoma. Anyway, later on, the daughter seemed still a little shaken up about reliving the whole story, and so the father tried to talk to her about it again about a month or so later and she was having none of it, saying she's still scared to talk about it, to think about it. She doesn't even want to discuss it anymore. And even as the years progressed, she would ignore any questions. And while the dad doesn't ultimately know what they saw, but he just knows they're scared and definitely saw something due to how terrified they were when his daughter and husband were both terrified by telling the story and the fact they won't even talk about it all these years later. Vanessa decided to share a compilation of experiences dating through the years 1988 to 2009. Feelings of being watched, wildlife silenced, tree breaks, strong smells, numerous late night vocalizations, rock knocking, and things being thrown near her tent, and an actual daytime sighting. Vanessa's husband and her have been camping and caving in the Trout Lake, Washington area for about 20 years now, and are both very experienced in the outdoors, particularly in the Northwest. They've gone primarily to this area for caving, or for those of you who take it more seriously, spelunking, for many years. The first encounter with something unusual was right around 1988 to 89, on a caving trip in this area as they had penetrated the forest, heading toward Mount Adams through some old clear cut to visit a very well familiar cave. Bird song of various types is always present, but as they had made their way toward the tree line, the bird song and even insect noise seemed to cease. Vanessa looked up with no indication of foul weather or damp wind indicating rain. Their group, which she thinks at the time was about seven or eight of them, were all familiar with deep woods, and a couple of people noted that this behavior was strange, the noise is falling silent and having no signs of foul weather coming. They all stopped in their tracks, even though nobody had heard anything like a large predator being nearby. Everybody was looking around, all listening very intently. But something seemed wrong. And then Vanessa had a powerful sense of being watched from further in, not too far away, but she did not tell anybody else. She did not want to stir panic. She felt the others sensed this as well, and they all pushed quickly on to get to the cave, sticking close to one another. This happened on several caving trips over the years, but not in this exact location. The proximity, however, was pretty close, all within about a five mile radius. And yet there was another time, around 2002. Vanessa's partner and her had dispersed camping alone, right next to a very seldom used forest road in the same area, east of the main forest road. They got out on their vehicle to begin setting up camp, and as they had done several other times in the same area, and noticed an almost vomit-inducing stench it was not the smell of something dead, it was like a combination of sun-baked garbage and feces. It was decided that perhaps some local had driven back here and maybe dumped their trash, but then about five minutes later, the smell just simply went away. Vanessa has no idea about the smells encountered by others at this time, so they simply blew it off. They walked around, sniffing around the whole area just a little, and there was nothing. So they decided to camp there anyway, thinking... Maybe something just must have been carried by the wind, but it was still strange how strong and stink it was. They've also heard some late night sounds when camped at Peterson Prairie many times. Some dismissed them like coyotes, but these sounds were whoops with several animals at once. 
And Vanessa very clearly remembers silently filing through all the animal sounds in her head that she'd ever heard, you know, like elk, coyote, deer, cougar, wolves, marmots, bear, human, and her mind could come up with nothing but just simply blank. Nothing had matched the sound she was hearing. Still, they tried to dismiss them as coyotes and simply went to bed. But it was like something that was making the initial sound and the coyotes were answering. But then, later in 2003, another type of sound in this area made her blood turn to ice water. It was August, about 11.30 at night at Peterson, and Vanessa and her husband wanted the luxury of camping at a site instead of dispersed where there was running water and outhouses. They were dousing the fire and about to head into the tent. This is when from the north, about a half to quarter of a mile away, it seemed there began a howl. Now it was not a wolf or a coyote howl, but it almost reminded Vanessa of those emergency sirens in rural towns. The pitch was relatively low and then raised to a higher pitch and was held there for about six to 10 seconds, but was still very low in pitch altogether. She thought about Pavarotti and some of the very skilled baritones that she had heard in concert. Vanessa then came to a sickeningly horrifying conclusion that in all the years of voice that she'd studied and heard, not one human had ever uttered something at this pitch, nor could they do it at this volume. The lungs of whatever was doing this had to be massive, and as in the forest, it echoed a lot, but it was not the echoes that made it sound strange. Vanessa just looks at her husband, who was also clearly startled, looking at her, and then they looked at some of the other campers across from the scrub from them. They had stood up and were motionless, looking back at them, then looking in the direction it was coming from, and Vanessa asks, what is that? But her husband said he didn't know. They remained standing, and it continued on for about two minutes, then ceasing. They had never heard anything like that in all the years they have camped and caved in the area. No human lungs were capable of that kind of power. And Vanessa has always been a die-hard tenter backpacker, but that night, she could not sleep in the tent. She was simply too frightened by the realization that what she had heard was impossible. No creature existed could make this kind of sound. Unless she remembered that this area had quite a few Bigfoot sightings over the years. She could not accept it, but she could also not sleep in the tent. So they simply got their bags and pads and slept in the truck that night. She barely slept and was very glad to be leaving in the morning. Vanessa was shaken for quite a while. Vanessa and her husband went to the Mount Adams Ranger Station in town that morning on the way out and asked if there were any unusual animal activity the night before. The ranger just looked at Vanessa like she was under the influence. Vanessa never said the words, but she knows that he knew what she was thinking. The ranger, of course, covered her tracks and said she had not heard anything and had no idea what she was talking about. And for Vanessa, sometimes terror and curiosity go hand in hand, because in 2004, they decided to go back to the area, the same one they camped at in Peterson, as there's no way that she can get used to camping this way. So they're there, visiting their favorite caves in the area, and early the last afternoon, her husband and her decide to go cave hunting. And of course, she looks back, wondering what she was thinking, but it was broad daylight, so she just assumed they would be okay. Her and her husband trekked down a side forest road that was so overgrown with vine maple and had significant tree fall at the beginning so that you could not drive it anymore. They bushwhacked through the grown-up vine maple and the remnants of a clear cut and split up and planned to come around to meet each other. As her and her husband knew, this particular forest road curved around a bit. And after a while, she had had enough bushwhacking and decided to just meander down the forest road on some more even terrain. So she headed toward the mountain on this road with her husband. Off in the deep bush to her left, she noticed how warm it was and that it was uncomfortably hot and still. Nothing but the sound of her boots crunching on the packed gravel. And then she had heard the gravel move behind her, probably about 20 yards. And she took her time turning around thinking that it was perhaps a cow because this was an open range area. And as weird as it seems to see cows in the forest in clear cut, it's not exactly uncommon, but whatever it was had a very heavy sound. And then she felt faint, like she was going blind and seeing colors and shot up with some hallucinogen all at once. And she watched as a huge dark haired cinnamon colored human like thing cleared the ditch in one stride, gliding into the tree line in one more lightning step 
and then stood absolutely still. And there Vanessa was, all by herself, in the middle of this isolated forest road with this hairy humanoid-like creature, a cinnamon-colored shoulder and arm unhidden behind a tree. The shoulder was massive, as was the arm, and so long that it was almost as tall as she was. If she looks, for example, at the door jam in her office, she'd put the shoulder's height at just under the bottom of the post. She could even see the contour of the muscles under the hair and fur. It was obviously a powerful animal. The hair and fur appeared to be about three inches long, and she couldn't see the entire hand as it was blocked by some undergrowth. And there it was, just standing stock still, watching Vanessa. Did it think it was entirely hidden? Vanessa had heard about people being paralyzed with fear and could never imagine that, but that's precisely what was happening. She thought she was going to die very soon, and she really had no idea what was going to happen. She was utterly frozen in fear and defenseless. She wanted to move, but she could not. She thought it might chase her if she ran. She could not turn her back on it. And at some point, survival mode had kicked in all the way because she remembers her training about bears, and she began to back away very slowly spoke very quietly, and was even tempted to leave her pack. It still did not move and stay there, still as stone. She must have backed down that gravel about 100 yards, and since there was no movement still, she had decided to risk it and yell for her partner. There was no other way out of there. And she yelled for help at the top of her lungs, and her husband finally answered, Where are you? And she somewhat meekly called back, Here! afraid that her shouting might have the opposite effect of what she had wanted and potentially agitating this unknown creature. A few minutes later, her husband comes crashing through the underbrush, panicked on his face, and he asks what was wrong. And so Vanessa just tells him that a bear, who looked disgusting and angry, had tried to attack her. And he asked her where it was, and so Vanessa had pointed up there and that it was now gone. After looking around a bit, Vanessa and her husband did leave from the area. They cut through the vine maple opposite the encounter and hightail it back to the car. As Vanessa thought about it afterward, she noted that there was no smell during this encounter to warn her, but there was also no wind that afternoon and it was really hot. It took her four years to even tell her husband what she truly saw. And fortunately, she claims her husband is pretty reasonable and believes, with astonishment by the way, what she's recently told him. And in 2009, her and her husband both camped in Peterson Prairie again in August. They had a lot of reservations about camping in a tent there due to the previous encounter in the area, but thought that with all the other campers around, which there was like six to seven sites being occupied and right next to the obnoxious camp host RV, there wouldn't be a chance of having a sighting. It was raining, which is very unusual for that time of year in the evening they pulled into the campground and set up the tent at the site just north of the camp host. They made dinner and called it a night, with it still raining outside. But something had woken up Vanessa at about 2.30 in the morning. It sounded like two rocks being knocked together down the primarily dry creek bed south of them. Vanessa was listening for sounds of clothing, car or camper doors or soft voices, thinking someone was up really late. And after listening intently for about five minutes to the sounds of light rain on the tent walls, there were no human sounds or movement nearby. Then, the rocks knocked again, just a couple of times. She wanted to wake up her husband to have him hear, but the sleeping bags make so much noise and she couldn't be sure he'd be silent when waking. She was then shocked and terrified by what she had heard next. Something whooshed nearby. And then she hears a thud on the ground. She was astonished. What can be moving so fast through the air that it would make a loud whooshing sound? She listened for any sound of leaf noise in case a tree limb had fallen, but no undergrowth impact noise nor leaf noise, as she has heard before when a limb falls. What could be whooshing so strongly through the air that she hears it and then hears an impact nearby? Something was being thrown or beaten on the ground, and based on her experience in the area, she's pretty sure that it was rocks or pieces of wood. But how big or close does it have to be to where you could actually hear a whoosh? Now that was terrifying. She was literally afraid for her life if one of whatever it was had hit her or hit the tent. And she had listened for footfalls or scrub noise to see if she could tell if something was coming closer. But there were no footfalls, but another whoosh slash thud. And now she was out of her mind with fear, thinking they'd be hurt or killed by an impact through the tent. How is it that she didn't hear something close by? either breathing or moving, 
it must have been from quite a distance, meaning that something big was chucking large objects in the tent's direction from far away. Vanessa, of course, did not sleep the entire night. Her husband woke up around dawn, and there she was, in her sleeping bag, still wide-eyed and terrified. He, of course, asked Vanessa how long that she had been awake, and she told him the entire night. Then she goes on to tell him what she had heard, and he informs her that he'd wished that she had woken him up, and actually really wanted to hear or see one. And then she tells him that she didn't want to risk them becoming a potential target, so she just remains still. As they're both getting older, they now have a micro camper that they're going to start using to camp and boondock with. So, a trip down to Skamania or Klickitat County is soon to be on the books. But, of course, both those counties in southern Washington are also hotbeds for Bigfoot stories and sightings as well. And, of course, while Vanessa's stories and experiences in Washington are pretty hair-raising, they're just one of the thousands that occur in this state of Washington every day. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I would love to know your guys' opinions. And also, guys, if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button. And if you're new to the channel and enjoy this kind of content, be sure to go ahead and hit that big old red subscribe button and keep your notifications turned on as it really helps my channel out. And with that said, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll catch you guys in the very next episode.